Welcome to The Profile, I'm Gary Dunn, and in the comfy chair tonight is Mr. Martin Sillier. How are Hi, you, Gary. Martin? It's been a long time. A long, long time. How have you been? Very well. Yeah, Excellent. very well, thank you. Excellent. So, Martin, where were you born? In England, in uh, Rochford Hospital, which is in Essex, in the south east of England, near the mouth of the River Thames. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, what instruments do you play? Guitar. Guitar is how I make my living. Uh, a few other things badly, but guitars in. <laughs> so the turning point in your life where the light bulb went on, you thought, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. What was that moment for you? I think it was when my father played some songs from the 60s. Uh, we had a tape. My dad used to work for a company called Echo in England. Yeah. And then he we immigrated to Australia in 1968. And he worked for a company in Perth in Baller Street called AWA. Yeah. We always had a tape record, a real to real tape recorder at home. He would record off the radio. And he was a big Cliff Richard uh, and the Shadows fan, and also Beatles, and bands that were uh, Stones came in, and all those sort of bands. So he would record that stuff, and we would have it playing around the house. Yeah. And then I heard a song called Rise and Fall of Flingelbunt. Um, most people say Apache is their big song, but yeah. Rise and Fall of Flingelbunt was the one that did it to me. It just sounded just uh, a one-off recording. It just sounded so tough. Well, I've seen you play Apache on your on your one of your albums. Yeah. I've just done it. My new. I've just done a oh, video. I can okay. get. Moving forward to move okay. back, yeah. I've just done a video of Apache. For, uh, that, 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 Apache was the first song I ever played in public. Yes, maybe uh, that's when that's I saw you. Yes. First song was Morley High School <laughs> in, the, in the gym. Mark, Mark over there was probably at, the, at that particular event. It probably wasn't very good. We play, I remember playing six, so, six songs. He's shaking his head. So. And we played, first song we played was Apache. The first song I ever played in front of an audience was Apache. Now, uh, backtracking to last week, I've just done a video. The record company chose the song, said, we want to do a video for this, and we're going to do the song's Apache. I thought, well, I'm not going to argue. I've learned not to argue. I'm not going to argue. So I did the video last week, <laughs> and so it's sort of a full circle. Wow. Because I've done my version of uh, The Sh Shadows Apache. I've just done my version of it. Wow. Mm. So we're going to see that soon. Very that, soon. That's not on this. It is. Second last song. Oh. Look at this, red and black. Mr. Martin Cilia, can you get that there, Strawny? Shadow Man album. Shadow it comes Man. in a full circle. Wow, that's unreal. Um, okay, so we'll talk about that later. So your first band, Reverb, 1974. Who was in that band? And um, Well, Reverb, I, I'm a bit confused with band names from school. I can't remember what our band name at school was. Mm. I, I know there's a band called Plastic Iron. We had that for 10 minutes. Plastic Iron. We, because we had a drummer, was, uh, his brother was a fan of Iron Butterfly okay. or whatever. And we thought, oh, Plastic Iron, you know. <laughs> we were like 12 or 13. And, and then we did that. And a band called Reverb. Or the Echoes were taken. So we thought, oh, we'll call ourselves Reverb, you know. Mm -hmm. Seemed obvious at the time. And we, we'd just play. Um, we did a lot of gigs with that band. We'd play. Um, actually, inter another interesting thing, moving forward to move back. I just did a show with a band called Mental As Anything uh, last Thursday at the Stirling Arms Hotel in Guildford. Mm. Yeah. I was playing there when I was at school in 1974 wow. with the band Reverb. On Wednesday nights, we did about a year there. Every so Wednesday 35 night. years later. No, more, 45. More, yeah. Maybe 73, 74. Mm. And also I remember but we had this conversation with the band uh, last week and... Uh, all I remember about the, those gigs were there's a stripper on every Wednesday night. Yes. I, one of my favourite, I remember her. And so I'd go to school the next day. It wasn't greedy, was it? Um, thank goodness it wasn't. No. I'd go to school the next day and the guys, all the guys going to, and girls would go, oh, yeah, so how, who was the stripper last night? And they'd go, oh, Katrina, you know. And I, what should you do? i go, oh, no, but we played this great version of Jumping Jack Flash and we even got the ending right, you know. <laughs> and I was so into the music, like, yeah. duh. <laughs> and uh, that's what it was like. And so like, we did that gig and we, so the pubs reopened again. So we played there last Thursday. And there was no, I looked through, kept looking through the door and those trippers came out. But you can no. only hope, you know. It wasn't the Charles. No. So you played in a band called Bootleg? I did. In 77. So where did you play? Who was in that band? Well, let's get back to the reverb band. Uh, yep. Basically, the band was Tony Cooper, yep. who went on to play with Visitor, I think, in Perth, and he's yes. a Saracen. Yeah, and Visitor, of course. And yeah. Saracen, he's in Sydney doing very well at his music. Mm. Um, there was a guy called Peter Curley on bass and vocals. He's no longer with us. And there's a keyboard player called Neil Chapman, yep. who I've lost touch with. Again, he went to M Morley High School. Wow. Neil went to Morley Everyone High. went to Morley. Yeah. With Mark Whitehouse. With Mark. It was a bad school. That and school. then Bootleg was a, that band went on to be uh, a couple of different guys. Myself and the bass player, 
I can't, actually can't remember who the drummer and singer were. Okay. But that's a long time ago. Yeah. You moved to England, 1980. So why 79, did, uh, yeah, 79, yeah, I moved so, to England. So why did you move and you joined a band called Urban Clear? I did. Um, I went to England because I wanted to broaden my horizons. I thought I, I could see the field of scene changing. Yeah. I thought, well, do I want to be playing the Chelsea Tavern for the rest of my life? And I thought, <laughs> uh, probably not. You know, I thought I'll do, I can do that when I'm older. Yeah. You know, um, so I went to England. I joined an original band there called Urban Clearway. We had a few, uh, we made a few lots of recordings, and uh, we got some interest from Island Records. Yeah, you know, but it's all a talk. Yeah. But the thing with that, what happened with me was, it, living in London, on your own, without a proper income, is really tough. Yes. So we were about to, well, it was talks of signing with Island Records, and I got a call from Perth, and this, from my friends of mine, they said, hey, we're doing this gig, we're gonna to go to Port Hedland, get the band together, I'm gonna do, got three months booked in Perth. And they offered me a wage, and he actually got dinner. <laughs> you know, and I thought, oh, you get to eat, oh. So I came back to Perth thinking, oh, I'll come back to Perth for, you know, three months, yeah. I have money, I'll go back to England, and then, and then I can survive Continue. another year. Yeah. I never went back, because yeah. things just kept on, going on yeah. in Perth and there's, Perth was really happening then. Yeah, there's so many things going yeah. on, wasn't there? So that was Messenger? That, uh, yeah, band called Messenger. We went up to Port Hedland and yep. uh, did those sort of things. As Wolfgang Collar was a singer, Gavin oh. Bell was a bass player. Wolfgang's doing sound for us at gigs now. Is he? Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen Wolf, Wolfie for years. Yeah, he's still good. Um, drummer was Simon Locke. Yeah. Lise, Leslie Hill on keyboards. Oh. Wow. Lisa's sister. Lisa's twin. sister. Uh, mm. Yeah, sister, yeah. Yeah. So you joined Invasion Force with Alf Damassi and yes. Lloyd. Lloyd so. Allison, Alf Damassi. Yeah. was Tony that? Tilly singing. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't remember. Drummer was Simon Locke, I think. Mm. And then. Was that early Flying Fonzie release? Well, really? basically, that, we, we came, came and we did that band. We were doing like Duran Duran and top, you know, uh, B52s, mm. top 40 songs. And we realized we were doing four gigs a week, managed by Brian Davison. Yeah. Doing okay but we couldn't see how we could maintain it and keep the future going. So we took four weeks off. We saw the Blues Brothers movie. Yeah. <laughs> and we formed this band called Flying Fonzarellas, which name was, we were gonna, actually we went out as the Flying Ducks in the first few gigs. The Flying Ducks? That's the corniest name we could think of. You know, the ducks you get on the wall, yes. you know? <laughs> so we actually did some gigs as the Flying Ducks, which no one really knows about, because <laughs> there's no one there. And then um, Peter Hayes, Pinky Hayes, yes. suggested Fonzarellas. Flying Fonzarelli's, mm. and we went, oh, okay. Remember Peter from No Sweat? And, mm. and so our management team was Peter and uh, Brett Townsend. O He's running the Oxford now, I own it. Is he? Oxford Hotel. That'd be right, yeah. And then um, John, what's John's other name? Uh, drummer John. No, John. Oh. Um, Pete Townsend. No, um, uh, Pete Townsend. Confused, Pete. confused now. Who? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we, we went on with that, with that management, and that. And that kicked off basically Brett Town, John Hopkins. John Hopkins. John Hopkins. Right. Um, they basically managed us and took us to the next level where yeah. we're doing the, you know, the, the recordings and the, and the, you know, the mm. overflows, the raffles and whatever. Because I notice on that album they say Richard Fonzarelli, who we know as Richard Roberts, obviously. Well, Richard Roberts, yeah. Everyone changed their name on that album except for me. Okay. I didn't want to, I thought, oh, I might So that Martin one. Fonzarelli didn't, no. didn't fly. Well, it could have been anything, you know, mm. and then I, um, they said, but you've got to have something. Yeah. So they gave me, you know, Martin Katas earlier. But I thought, well, if you've got to, if it's your name, just wear it. If you, you're going to change mm. it, change it or wear it. So you had huge crowds, didn't you? 83 to 80. Um, right, yeah. And... It's one of those bands where you do your first gig and you go, ooh, something going on here. Mm. Uh, I remember the first week we played, we were doing places like the Plimpton on a Sunday in yeah. Fremantle, you know, and yeah. uh, Sterling Arms yeah. in, um, on the highway there. And uh, I remember after about three or four weeks, the first week there might be 50 people at, say, yeah. on a Sunday session. After about four weeks, it was pretty full. Yeah. We were getting the uni, yeah. uni crowd. We, we tapped in the uni crowd mm. and we had good marketing. Yeah. Um, and the band was good. It was yeah. a good band, well rehearsed, yeah. good yeah. band with a strong uh, focus. Yeah. A strong, you know, image. And then we went from there. We managed to get our way up the, up the scale yeah. where we ended up at the raffles and the, yeah. the overflow as yeah. it was then and the Florida, yeah. I think, and the yeah. generator and... So we ended up with the, those shows, and we had those gigs for maybe 18 months yeah. every week. There were massive crowds in those days, and great times, weren't Yeah, they? the only thing I didn't like was you turn up, you turn up too late, you can get a parking spot. Yes, <laughs> to your own gig. You know. Hey, I'm the guitar yeah, player. But now in these days, that's kind of a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But you remember you turn up, you can't get a parking yeah. spot, you go, oh, geez, I've got to turn up Careful early. Careful what you wish for, isn't it? Yeah. 
Okay, so you joined Midget and the Farrellys. Well, okay, so Fonderelli, yeah. we yeah. did our time with that, and yeah. then I uh, went on to, I did about a week with Dave Warner doing okay. uh, one of his 60s shows. I knew yeah. Dave previously. I knew oh. Dave earlier, yeah. but never been in, yeah. uh, in, in a musical situation with him. And then uh, I got a call, with, I did a 60s show with Dave for a little bit, and then... That was sensational 60s, yeah. was it? Yeah, yeah that's right. I, remember that. I did a few of those, and then I went on to uh, Music and the Farrellys, which yeah. is a fun band. Yeah. I wanted to be, do the opposite, Fonzarelli's and all those bands were here, I wanted to be in the other scene. Um, Who was in Midget and the Farrellys? Midget, Hayden Pickersgill. Yep. Tilly was a singer. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, two keyboard players. Johnny Crooks was the first keyboard player, who lived two doors up from me, grew up two do doors up from me. And Neville Dowling All right. yeah. uh, was the other keyboard that came in later. Neville yeah. was in The Visitor and yeah. uh, Expression. Yeah. They, did the, they did quite well with Mushroom Records. And then we had Clarence Bailey from the Jugites on drums. Wow, yeah. That was a good little band. Mm. And we used to do, in the America's Cup time, we were doing six gigs a week in Frio. Yeah. So you toured with Dave Warner, didn't you? Or then I went on tour with Dave. Yeah, we went, uh, I've been everywhere with Dave Darwin, Alice Springs and... Yeah, and I'm still working with Dave to this day. Cool. Just did an album last year, and yeah. we actually, I got a call from Dave the other day. We're doing back in recording, and I yeah. get back to Sydney. Can you ask him if he wants to come on the show, and so he can he can tell yes. his story? Yeah. Dave's got some good stories. He's, yeah, I'm sure he has. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved to Sydney. We where obviously you still live today. What happened was I what? joined. There's a band from New Zealand that came over to yeah. Perth in the late '80s. A band called the Brooks. Yeah. And I knew the keyboard player Mark Merton, and they got into the, there's a Perth Battle of the Bands or something. Yeah. And they sort of won their first heat. And then I got a call saying, look, a guitarist is going back to Sydney. Do you want to come and play? Uh, and then an hour later, I got a call, oh, do you know any bass players? So myself and Hayden Pickersgill, who's a middle, who's yeah. Farrell is, yeah. joined this band, the Brooks. We did all those other heats. We ended up winning this Battle of the Bands in Perth. Yeah. And the prize was a trip to Sydney. Wow. So I went to Sydney. And at the same time, Warner, Dave Warner already moved to Sydney. And uh, so I remember going there and I, and I came back after a little while. And then Dave did some more gigs. So I went back to Sydney and I thought, I'll just stay for a, a month or two. And I thought, I'll just stay for a year. I'm <laughs> still there. <laughs> you know, I still don't feel like I live there. It's but a great story. I still live there. So you join the Atlantics? Yeah, well, what happened was yeah, with th music... that big hit, didn't you, Bambora? Bambora. Yeah. What happened basically in the 90s, as you know, in Perth, it yeah. affected here as well, the whole live on the rock and roll scene mm. just died. Mm. It sort of went on a dive. So I decided, okay, I could go and join some sort of name band where you're just literally a hired hand, you can only work. When yeah. the main guy wants to work, you can, you can work. So you might work, work, you know, a few months a year. And I thought, well, how can I survive doing that? I can't. So I joined another band that was doing like corporate stuff and uh, basically I joined this band. Regular gigs. That had, had a, a repertoire of like four or five hundred songs. Yeah. We could do anything from Dixieland jazz to swing jazz and all that to rock and funk and dance music and techno. Great. I thought this is great. So I did that until, or did that for most of the 90s really. Yeah. And then I thought, I was always playing this dance music. You know, we're playing clubs, you hear the songs. I thought, oh. So I thought, I'm just going to make a record myself because you couldn't, music I wanted to hear, I couldn't find. Mm. So I'm just going to make, it, make my own album. Yeah. So I wrote these songs and, uh, and I just demoed them and I had them on a cassette. And I was out one day in, at the Annadale Hotel in Sydney and someone said to me, oh, you should meet Bosco Bosnak. He was a bass player in the original Atlantics. I went, yeah, yeah, I'd like to meet him. So I went and had a yeah. chat and uh, I said, oh, Bosco, you know, I had a cassette in my pocket. He had cassettes in those. I had a cassette with three or four songs. And I said, <laughs> you could have them in your pocket. It's yeah, easy. you know, cassette pulled out. I said, you know, um, I'm, I'm recording an album. The studio's booked in a couple of weeks. Um, I'd love you to come and play bass on whatever you want to do. Mm. I gave him the cassette and he goes, why would you want your cl my clunky old bass on your recordings? <laughs> I'm going, just, just, just have a listen. If you don't <laughs> like it, it's fine. No hard feelings. Mm. Uh, about a week later, I got a call from him and he said, um, look, uh, I don't want to play in your recordings. I went, oh, fair enough. He goes, but you can play live, can't you? I said, yeah, well, that's what I do. There's no tricks. And he goes, uh, would you like to join the Atlantics? We've been looking for someone for 30 years. Okay. And wow. he goes, there's only one thing. We want to play your songs. <laughs> and I go, someone on the phone going, yeah, okay, uh, yes. 
<laughs> and I, I said, well, shouldn't we all meet up and see if we get on first? And basically we all met up. We turns out they used to live, you know, within, you know, a hundred meters of where I was living at the time. Yeah. yeah. In Coogee. I was in Coogee and they, that's where they wrote Bambora. Wow. So it's just around the corner from where I was living. So when I said where I lived. So what oh, was Bambora about? Bambora is an instrumental, instrumental mm. surf song. Mm. Bambora but, is uh, waves breaking under the, yeah. under the water. Yeah. Um, it's an, it's an Aboriginal word. Yeah. And it sort of represents the, you know, the aggressiveness, aggressiveness of this music. Yeah. But Bambora was a big hit in 1963, mm. end of 63. Mm. It was number one for eight weeks. Yeah. And it was a, a, written by the band. Mm. Uh, and there's lots of stories that go with that, how bands were in those days. I mean, when I joined the band, we go on tour. After the gig, I'd sit them all, get everyone, give them a drink, sit around. I get the stories out of them. You've got to tell me why you still remember. <laughs> And I asked her about how they recorded Bombora, and which is still sounds still sounds brilliant to this day. It just sounds mm. yeah. great. It's a great recording. Yeah. They said, "Well, we went in the studio at EMI three hundred one up the stairs, no lift up the stairs, all their gear, two guitars plugged through one amp. I think it was. Crazy, you know how you used to remember how we yeah, used to yeah, do two crazy. guitars in one amp. Crazy. And then they said there's three <laughs> mics in the room, and they because it sounds so good for that. Yeah, three mics mm. in the room. They played it once and they did a B side." Mm. which was green sleeves. They did a conversion mm. of green sleeves. That's the B-side. And they didn't even go in the control room. There's guys in the white coats. Didn't go in the control rooms. And, the, and they just said, um, uh, thank you, boys. We're done. That was great. And the next time they heard the song was on the radio. <laughs> well, they're out. Unreal, isn't it? And, you know, they said, oh, look, there's actually a, good, a mistake mm. on the wrong note on the guitar in there, but that's now part of the melody. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> great, isn't it? You etched into Yeah, that's history. what, yeah. You etched into history. So you've recorded six or seven solo albums. Yeah, something um, like that, yeah. Can you tell us about those? And Well, the first solo al album happened in uh, 2007. I was on the way to a gig with the Atlantics in Noosa. I got picked up at the airport there, and uh, the head of the record company that had, was doing the Atlantic stuff, um, David Muneer, just said to me in the, in the car on the way back, um, What's it going to take to get a solo album out of you? Mm, well, time and money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he, David being David, who just is a doer, mm. said, uh, just ran me a few days later. I've got, I've got the studio booked in March. Uh, I've, got, I've got the week. Um, we, we start 10 o'clock on Monday by Stumps on Friday. I want an album done. Wow. Okay. So cool. I went to Adelaide and did it at a place mm. called Mixed Masters with yeah. Mick Wordley. Yeah, know Mick. Yeah. Mick, Mur Mick Wordley, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah you yeah, know yeah. Mick from the other days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I worked with Mick a lot. But anyway, so we did this album with Mick and uh, I think by Wednesday we were down the pub, it was done. Yeah, yeah. Cool. You know, we just did two guitars, just mm. bass and drums, there was no tricks. Yeah. And mixed as well. Yeah. So currently today, Mental as Anything, you, you tour with them. So yes. Talk to me about, talk to me about that. How, what's the experience like there? And Okay, with Men Mental as a great band. Are you as greedy or? Well, there's stories, but no, Greedy's top guy. He's really good. Yeah. He's, um, yeah, yeah. Ex exceptionally good. And I think with mental, basically what happened with mentors, I was doing the Atlantic still. We did our last tour of Europe. We toured from all the way from Finland down. We ended up in Athens as our yeah. last gig in 2013. And um, a couple of the other guys are older than me. And we got back and we thought, let's retire where we're on top. Quit retire. We still have yeah. our uh, records. We still have all that, but we don't mm. play live. And um, the band was sounding, we got a really good reception in Europe. We thought, let's quit while we're ahead. So I came back home, uh, home thinking, what, what am I going to do now? What were the size of the audiences in Europe that you were playing to? Oh, it varied. Uh, we were doing festivals like, I don't know, thousands. We'd, I think the best gig I've ever done was in, uh, this, we did this occupied fort in Rome. Yeah. And I didn't know what, we just roll up there and it's like, you know, this big fort thing. And our dressing room was like, you felt like you'd be fed to the lions. <laughs> you know, and then you go on stage, the support band were playing some of my, my, my songs. Wow. I thought, this is really weird. Yeah. So we got on play and these, it was like playing a, you know, a big day out, but playing, we were just playing instrumental surf tunes yeah. and they knew our songs. Wow. Uh, it was just packed. Like, imagine like the Coliseum, just mm. with people. It was like that. No lions? I didn't see them. Okay. I think they, I, I, yeah, yeah, I didn't get to me, but it, was, it, it felt like that. Yeah. Um, and anyway, we, so we got back home and I walked in the door and uh, there's a message. Mentors are looking for you. Mm. Oh, okay. And then... Um, yeah, I ended up joining Mentals, and uh, I've been on the road ever since. I don't think I've been has home. It, uh, is it mental as anything on the road with those yeah, guys yeah, or? yeah, yeah? It's pretty good. Um, and the thing about mental as anything, one of the things that it was two things that attracted me. 
But the one thing was that Mentals have had more songs in the Australian Top 40 than any other band. Wow. Including the Stones or Beatles or whatever. More songs. I mean, some of them might have been 36 mm. in the Top 40. They've had more songs in the Australian Top 40 yeah. than other bands. Wow. So when you play a gig, it's not about, about where do you put your hit. Like, for example, Live It Up is a big song generally, but that's early in the set. We get that out of the way. Do you play the lead solo twice or once? I do it twice, like the edit. Great. There's an edit. Well, we actually did that song at Pub Legends, and yeah. I just wanted to do it twice because it deserves to be Well, I just say, look, give me, give me the first time down, to rehearse it. That's it. First time to rehearse it, second time to get it right. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is, it, it's, a, it's a great solo. Well, yeah. Mm. And the funny thing about that, Greedy actually wrote the solo. Did he? Yeah. Okay, so while we're on Greedy, why the headphones with Greedy Smith? Can Greedy you Smith me? has taken to the headphones in the last three years or so. I think because Marty Plaza and myself, might have mentioned to him one night, he was a bit loud on stage. Okay. Keyboards. Keyboard players are never too loud, you know. But anyway, just when, you, when you get an organ pad going and you've got to try and get guitars through, you just can't. Mm. that's why we used Stratocasters in the 80s because mm. of all the uh, keyboards. You to try and pierce through, yeah. yeah, yeah you don't have to correct. go through the keyboards. So, um, and the drummers and... That's God, right. You know, you know, with their enormous... Yes, just all sorts of stuff, Side yeah. fills and whatever they had. Yes. So um, Greedy thought, you try a way of monitoring. So he, what he's done, he, 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 we just went to the shops one day, next morning, bought a set of headphones, put them on, and he's got, he's got a little mixing desk on his keyboard there, and he, and he can control his own level. He said, oh, I can pitch better now. I can hear my singing. I can pitch. And he can have whatever he wants. And he's got them open back so he can still hear the band okay. in the background. Wow. But, and then one day, about a year ago, he got this idea of painting them gold. So we, next thing I know, we're driving between gigs, and he, we call into this hardware store, he buys this gold paint, he's in the dressing room spraying his headphones gold. And that's what he had on the other night. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. So story. that's the story. So basically it was just, uh, and, and think about it, I said to Greedy, why you look a bit sort of weird with like gold, with the headphones on? He goes, people expect that of me. <laughs> 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 you know? Yeah. But no, it's good. It's a really good band to tour with. Yeah, cool. We won't talk about the stories you were talking to us before about, but anyway, so... You're really influenced by a musician or band, so what influenced you the most? Hank B. Marvin. Hank B. Marvin. And The Shadows. Yep. Or Bruce Welch. We're going to have him on the show soon. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, we've got to go to his place, I think. That's fair enough. Yeah. Great guitar player. He's a Geordie. He's, Hank's just a lovely guy. He's uh, a really good, he's just yeah. a natural musician. Yeah. A wonderful guy. So, um, your favourite band of all time? I have to say The Shadows. For that real, I look my new album, you know. Mm. I have Shadow to say, Man. Shadow Man. That was actually record company's idea. Merit to them. Wow. I wouldn't have had the guts to do that. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, they, they, they chose that name and I thought, yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I have to say the Shadows. I mean, I love, I love Purple and Blackmore. That'd be yeah. my next. With it? Oh, yeah. yeah, totally. Cool. Okay, so if you were stranded on a deserted island, mm. you can only take one album with you. So you can only listen to one album. Obviously, it's going to be repetitive. What, what would that be? Okay, it's, my first instinct was to say Machine Head. Yeah. <laughs> but my second instinct is to say the album that I made when I couldn't find music that I liked. So I made an album that ended up becoming the Atlantic Slide of the Surf Guitar. Oh, okay. I'd probably take that. Wow. Even though I did play some guitar on it, I'd probably take that because the album I made when I couldn't find the music mm. I wanted to hear. Wow. Yeah. So you were in Perth for a while. What was the best Perth band you saw live? I'm thinking, well, Chalice, Bakery. Wow. Uh, Faye Lumpkin were great. I just remember I'm quite young, so I yes, just same. Yeah. You know, I, I maybe they maybe they're more impressive by memory. But Breakaway, mm. Breakaway were another one. I like Breakaway. Just I just thought they had a, they were a solid band. Mm. You know, yeah, great. Uh, I used to see them a lot. Um, I did see a band called Train with Dennis James for a little bit. Yeah. So did that influence you as well as as you know people like the Beatles or definitely or Hank Marvin? Or well, I I saw bands like. Uh, say Bakery, to me they were quite progressive. And Peter Walker, what a great guitar mm. player! Fantastic, fantastic. You know, he just sounded like oh, it's just a little bit, you mm. know, above average. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and, and I learned oh, okay. Um, the other band, Lindsay Wells, fantastic guitar mm. player. You know, very. Uh, he's known in certain regions in Australia, but very underrated generally. Uh, I saw Lindsay, and I went okay. Right, I get it now. There's a guitar player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and obviously John Meyer and those guys, and Dave yeah. Hole. I mean, yeah. like Dave Hole, I was trying to explain to some mm. people in Sydney recently, Dave mm. Hole was playing uh, those Hendrix songs, Purple yeah. Haze, in the late 70s, the yeah. same as years now. We used now. to go and see them. Yeah. Like, 
and at the city and the this place this album the here or this mm. um, uh, concert for Pecco, um, mm. they we all got together. We got the whole everyone on stage. Mm. And Fantastic! It was unreal. People like Dave were playing like that then. Yeah, yeah. There's no, you know, they've just they were ready there. Mm. Um, yeah. What was your favourite TV show growing up? Happening seventy would be the first. Happening seventy. Remember Happening seventy? <laughs> Rusty Wiley and. <laughs> Because I remember seeing the Zoot on there playing Eleanor Rigby. Mm. I went, wow, Rick Springfield, that's a guitar mm. that spins around. Yeah. How do you do that? I've, I'm sure if I tried that, it'd be, you know, I'd break it, you know, or it'd be stuck on the roof or something. It's a hard song to play, Eleanor Rigby. Yeah. And, but, or to get right. Well, the dynamics. Feel, yeah. I've actually done that on my new album, but that's another oh, yeah. story. Okay. But I had good guys playing with me. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I had a Perth guy, James Gillard. You know James Gillard? Yes. Well, he's from... Perth. Yeah, he plays yeah. on my record. Oh, wow. Bass, bass. James is, you know, in Sydney now. He's Some great musicians from Perth, isn't there? Well, he was with Western Flyer and yes. he went over, yeah, and, mm. he, and Mondo Rock. He played yes. and comes at the boy and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so James plays on that. and Cool. Yeah. Excellent. So what does the future hold for you, Martin? More of mentors? Or? Uh, mentor. I, I, I can't see an end to mentors. Greedy won't stop touring, I don't think. And I can't see, I've never done anything else. Mm. You know, uh, I don't know what else to do. Uh, I, mean, I can't get a day job now. You know. What day <laughs> jobs that give you a drink rider? Oh, you didn't, you, you know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I really don't know. Yeah. So uh, I'm not really qualified for anything else. But I think, uh, I think I'd think i like to um, keep going with Mentals. Mm. We've, we've recorded a live album early this year. We just recorded the whole show straight, filmed it. It's filmed as well, but there's a live album out. Wow. Maybe the video will come out later. That was all done in one, yeah. one run. We did that. Um, so there's that coming out. And this, I'm sure Greedy's got some more songs he's going to send us soon. That's my next question. Are you writing songs? Um, yeah, I've written, I've got one co-write with Greedy. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's on the live album. Mm. It's like a, rock, a rockabilly rock and roll thing. Yeah. Uh, I think I would like to make a, maybe another solo album in a year or two. I've got enough material for it. Yeah. But making the album's easy. It's uh, all the stuff that follows. Yes. You know, you've got hard to, work or, yeah, to yeah, yeah. tour it or get it to people. Mm. And, and then I would like to do a, a jazz album. Yeah. I think that's the one thing I'd like to do, some sort of jazz, not real jazzy jazzy that no one mm. wants to hear it, but a commercial jazz album. Yeah. Something for yourself. Yeah, yeah. again, something, something I would like to Is that an unfulfilled hear. ambition you've got or? Make the jazz album. Yeah. Perfect. Mm. So do you collect anything? Unfortunately, I d well, guitars. Guitars come my way. Um, I've got quite a reasonable guitar collection, which mm. I call Tools of the Trade, and ampl amplifiers go with guitars. So, mm. yeah, so I've got quite a, quite a lot of... Um, Guitars and amps, like cool. classic vintage things. What would you put in your gravestone? <sighs> Don't disturb. Um, <laughs> uh, that's normally what I put in my hotel room. We've got so many hotel rooms now. I put, always put in Don't Disturb, Don't disturb. Outside, <laughs> outside the door. Um, you know, uh, what else would I put? Uh, the older I get, the better I was. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, I don't know. So, because um, I remember you... Um, and I, I think we were going for auditions at different times and your dad would, you'd be in the car, Victor would be driving you mm. to an audition. I can't remember what bands they were, but I, I remember no idea. clearly, you know, um, seeing you around at that time. And that, that was sort of mid seventies to, to sort of 78 and yeah. things like that. So. Yeah. That era, it was like when mm. you were starting, there's a lot of mm. people that are around now yeah. that were starting around the mid seventies. Mm. Uh, and we had. We didn't have to be good straight away. We had time to get good. Mm. You know what I mean? That's what I've always, looking back now. Now, if you're in a band, you've got to be good like almost immediately, like in the first yeah. year or a few months. But we had time yeah, to yeah. learn how to play in a band. I, yeah. I just felt that. I don't think you have that anymore. You yeah. gotta, and I think we went through an era of fantastic crowds and people going out. And, yeah, you know, not every, looking back, not every gig was a great one, but there was, no, there was nothing bad about it. No, no, it was great. Um, so is there something about Martin Silly we don't know that you'd like to share about with us or and you don't have to answer that question. I don't know if there is anything. No. Um, it's all on my website. It's all on your website? It's all on my website, martinsillier.com. Martin, More than I remember. www.martinsillier.com. That's it. So uh, what clip are we going to hear? After That's it? a good question. I, we haven't <laughs> picked a clip yet, but we will. I've just done it. I, I was in Adelaide last week. We did a... Um, a song called Apache, which is the first song I played at Morley High School. Yeah. The record company decided they wanted to do a video for Apache. So we shot that in Adelaide last week. So if that's... With mentors? No, it was just my solo. Oh, just... Okay. Yeah. 
even though I did get mentors to play on the rise and the pull of finger bunt. So that's on the record too. <laughs> so come on, guys. Get them in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, we've got a video coming up. But we'll we'll choose something appropriate. Cool. Don't forget to subscribe to the profile on YouTube. Please like our videos, comment, and let us know who you think we should interview. www.theprofile.com.au. And um, thank you so much, Martin, for coming in and talking Cheers, to Gary. us. It's good to see you. And, Likewise. And, uh, welcome back to Perth. Do it all again in 10 years. Mr. Martin Sillia, thank you. Thank uh, you. We'll see you next time. Thanks.
At Procopy, we can transfer audio to CD, make CD, DVD and Blu-ray copies, transfer video to DVD, Blu-ray or HD, digitise slides and photos and supply custom USBs. You can see more details at procopy.com.au or call us on 08 9375 3902 for more information.